that was rock bottom because I was so confused. I knew all these, uh, you know, live such a, in a way, a healthy lifestyle. Yeah. And my body just started to break down. So that was kind of like the humbling phase. So, you know, I, I kept doing stuff and, you know, that's where I actually created the kids book, the Powerman's Kids book. Cause I was like, you know, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel like an absolute mess, um, internally, but, you know, I can still do good things. You know, it's, um, so that's where I started to put my focus into the kids book stuff. And it was like, well, you know what? I need to create something that can continue the message uh, where I don't have to be there. You know, the book, someone can read the book, not even know me. And that makes a difference. So. Welcome to Power Perspectives. I'm your host, Shannon, a transformation coach. And today, my guest with the POW in Power Perspectives. From small town country, Australia, to three-time world champion athlete in kettlebell lifting, he's the creator and founder of the continent's first 30-day challenge. He's the owner and founder of one of the POW men, of the Pound Men book series, now in its third publication, helping parents and teachers empower, educate, and support their kids through life's inevitable challenges, specifically bullying. He's been featured on Sydney's Nine News segment and even a compelling contender in Australia's 2020 edition of The Bachelor. Uh, but where his real fire ignites is training and mentoring his beloved clients and as an insanely inspiring public speaker. The man, the legend, the all-around good guy you want on your team, Dave Pau to Welcome to Power Perspectives, Dave. Hey, Shannon. Good to be here. I'm excited. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I know I've asked you this before when I kind of first met you, but where does the POW come from in POW to me? POW, I'll give you the short version of it. There's a movie called okay. Step Brothers. And on the movie, Step Brothers, he's like, POW! He's like, <laughs> so, um, I so, so I used to be an uh, electrician. Yeah. And we, me, and my, me and my friend, um, who we both work together, we, we realized that the, the energy at work was quite negative. It was quite down and everyone would kind of drag on throughout the, throughout the day and yeah. uh, be really miserable. And, and we just made a pact one day. That we're like, we will never be like this. And we made a pact that, you know, we're going to find each other when we're 40 years old or whatever mm-hmm. and go and literally, if one of us has become miserable or bitter in life, you know, the other person's going to um, go give them a bit of wake up call. But the way we kind of did it um, initially and how it sort of came about was, if you, if we were working together and we had to do something, whether we lo- wanted it to or not, if we complained about it or whinge or become miserable, I could, if you complained, I could punch you in the arm as hard as I wanted to, um, to kind of like <laughs> snap ourselves out to never, never kind of yeah. deal with having to do things you don't want to do in that miserable way. Cause that yeah. just makes everything miserable. So then, um, that we, after a day of having dead arms, we, um, we started to talk about that movie. And then the power thing become a thing. So it was like, pow. So it was kind of <laughs> like we would say that to wake each other up to not be miserable if we caught each other being miserable. That's and then um, and then I started competing and it started to become a bit of a call sign. Before I would compete, I would be wrecked. I would be tired. But I realized that I uh, used to watch Arnold Schwarzenegger um, movies called Pumping Iron and he used to psych out his competitors yeah. before he even competes. So I would be warming up and I'm like, pow. <laughs> and so I'd do these things and everyone thought I was crazy, especially when I went to America and travel over the world competing. And uh, the funny thing was, is, um, you know, it put other people off their game but and, um, and, and, I, and I'm winning. Like it actually helped. Um, but it was a bit of a, bit of a joke. It just turned into something. <laughs> then now it's got a lot of different meanings, kids' books, and it stands now for power of words. So the way you speak about yourself and others is a lot about you and your internal world. Mm. Um, yeah. So. That's a, that's a bit of a story and it's sort of stuck, I guess. What a great origin story. And also when you do it, you're not just saying like, pow, you're like in your face, pow. So Yeah. Well, well pe- people think I walk around going, pow, 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 and, and I don't <laughs> at all. I normally, I normally do it to like scare the crowd at the end of a talk, you know, to yeah. wake people up. And, you know, I might talk about certain things about life and facing challenges and all that in, in the programs and the seminars that I do. Uh, and at the end, I kind of do that just to, pump some energy into people and sort of <laughs> snap them out of their slumber in a way. Well, it works. Um, yeah. And talking about origin stories, I mean, you're from a small country town in Australia and now you literally empower, I feel bad now if I don't say pow, you empower <laughs> people, like tens of thousands of people. Um, can you just walk us through a little, like a, a brief version of how you came to be where you're at today and, and, and doing what you love? Uh, well, growing up in a, in a small town, there's 552 people lived in my little town. And it was it was near the neighbor of another little bit bigger town. 
And I guess growing up, I saw, personally, I saw my, my parents struggle with a lot of different things. Um, you know, mental health in particular. My dad's had four mental breakdowns. Um, you know, and his prescribed medication that, you know, 90% of people have committed suicide on, like all these crazy things that my dad's had to go on through, like trying to get help. Um, he, he actually went to the doctors originally when I had a kidney issue and I got my kidney taken out when I was three years old. And my dad was just like stressed out, overworked, you know, like obviously it was a, it was a crazy time for them and me being sick. Like it even had doctors tell my parents that I had cancer and six months to live. So stressful scenario. But then my dad went to the doctors with an ulcer and they didn't have, they didn't treat ulcers with antibiotics back then. They actually just tried these uh, trial drugs. Mm. And so he went in with an ulcer and he, then next minute he's put into a mental hospital, put on sedatives, uh, rehypnol, two rehypnols before work every morning. Um, because he was a big guy too, they're like, yeah. oh, we don't want to make sure he's not violent. So they just pump my dad with all these drugs against his will. So, you know, one minute dad's, you know, working two jobs, you know, he's got a sick kid. Next minute he ends up in a mental hospital getting uh-huh. force fed drugs and injected with stuff he doesn't even know. So, um, so that had a massive effect on him and, you know, with the trauma of it and all these kind of things. And mm-hmm. growing up, you know, I didn't know all this part of this story until when I was really like in my teens where I can understand what all this sort of stuff, all, all, I, all I knew growing up was that I had a very stressed dad, yeah. you know, and my dad was different to everyone else's to a degree. Uh, amazing person, beautiful person, but, you know, he dealt with a lot of um, like everything was really a struggle. So mm-hmm. growing up in that atmosphere, I just always had this, um, I don't believe that when I'm bigger and when I'm older, I'm going to do things differently. You know, I'm going to find the answers, not just submit and expect the worst case scenario of things. Yeah. Um, so I'm lucky I had a lot of mentors and people that come into my life and become like my second dad, my third dad. And, and yeah. uh, my dad saw that I even needed this. So um, yeah, growing up in a small town, seeing the precious people are under and struggles. And I was like, hey, like, there's got to be a better way. And if this is life, let's make it, let's make it good. Even if we've got to struggle a little bit, even if we've got to do hard things, doesn't mean we need to be bitter and miserable and drag it on. Like, let's at least uh, have fun with it if we're going to work hard, you know? That's so that's, 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 I guess, the, the pressure cooker. Um, but, you know, in E12, uh, my dad had his second mental breakdown. So it was the first breakdown that I actually saw because I was only three at the time when he had his first. And then I, I failed English. Like I had all these things going on at home. Um, we had 12 English uh, teachers in my year 12 English. So I had no idea what I was doing at school. Um, you know, all this pressure to do your career and go to uni. And I actually failed English, got really good marks and everything else, but failed English. And at that point I discovered, um, I had a, a high school teacher take me under his wing who um, knew, knew kettlebell training. And he had the first kettlebells in Australia. So his name was Mark Elliott and he uh, was an ex-military guy, really respectable guy, like a father figure for me. And he introduced me to kettlebell training. And at that point, with all these dynamics going in my life, I was like, this is my vehicle. This is my thing. Um, you know, whatever it is, I don't know how I'm going to make the business or work or whatever. I want to do this. And, um, you know, I started training my sister. And that's how I kind of, that's how things felt. Like, you know, the university card got pulled out. Um, there's a lot of pressure and then I actually become an electrician as well. So I started the little gym, started training my sister and become an electrician, worked in bar, worked in a restaurant. Um, yeah, worked like seven days a week. And that's, that's what got me started in uh, the path. And my sister lost like 20 kilos and I saw yeah. the shift in her. And so I was like, Hey, you know what? Uh, I'm not perfect. Back then I had a speech impediment. You know, I had different sort of struggles and that, but I saw the change in someone else. And I was like, I love that. You know, that's awesome. If I could do this for the rest of my life and help people with this. Yeah. And um, that's kind of like the path. So that's that's kind of the tale of events in a, in a short way, really. That's great. And I think you said, um, I, I was watching your interview with Kerwin Ray, and uh, I think you're saying watching your sister's transformation is where you fell in love with being able to help people or help facilitate their their growth and their, their own evolution. So um, mm. I didn't know you had a speech impediment. I didn't know you had a, like, and you are a, like you speak all over the world. So you really transform something that might've been set a certain way into whatever you wanted it to be. And you're showing other people. You want, you want to know what that was? When I was a kid, I was told to be seen, not heard. Oh, so what do you think, word. you know, when you start believing this stuff, so 
So my dad, there's a lot of things. My dad's gone through a lot of trauma he's, and he's, uh, you know, and now like we're lucky we've got access to books and Dr. Joe Dispenza, we've got the internet and all that. But my parents' generation, they don't have any of this. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, just deal with it. You know, uh, they, didn't even, they, didn't, they didn't even know, they didn't even say to deal with it. They don't even know what it is. It's yeah. just like, that is, you know, everything presses their buttons and triggers in that way. So, um, yeah, so. Mm, well, thank you yeah. for sharing. Um, I'd, I'd love to ask you too, like, um, maybe that was your rock bottom, but um, can you talk about a time that, you know, you hit your rock bottom, you felt that you did and, and how you got out of that, what kept pulling you, pulling you out? Yeah. Well, I could say, you could say there's a, a few, I would say there's a few rock bottoms. So in that point there, it's when you don't fully have control of your life. Mm-hmm. You're, you're a teenager, you're transitioning. You know, you think it's rock bottom, but it's really just a start. Yeah. You know, you got to yeah. start somewhere. Yeah. So like those were challenging times, um, you know, dealing with the emotions of, you know, the stuff going on at home or working four jobs, um, you know, trying to, you know, somewhat be a kid still, uh, which I didn't, I just worked a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't even say it was rock bottom. It was just a starting point. Probably the, the hardest point was, um, a few, uh, de- like a few years ago, probably three, four years ago, actually the time when we met. Um, around that sort of time, I, I was doing a world speaking tour. So like the height of my career speaking and traveling the world and competing is, uh, there was glass in my food and I broke, uh, three teeth and I had an infection in my jaw when I was flying around the world. So I got to England and on the flight from New Zealand to England, I actually overdosed on Penelol just unknowingly. I'd never taken urethrin before. Um, and I just got it from the airport. So I had two packs of urethrin and a pack of Penelol on the flight. Uh, but I didn't realize how much I was taking. Um, I was just in that much pain. My face was yeah. swollen. And I was like, I must continue. I must do this. Yeah. I was like unstoppable work ethic, whatever. And um, so then that wrecked my liver. And unknowingly, after that, coming back from that, um, I then I then started to, like my body started to fall apart. Like I ended up getting a tooth out. I started losing my hair. I could only do like two to five minutes of exercise without feeling absolutely mm-hmm. wrecked. You know, I'd be in bed all morning. So that was hard enough. And then like, I'll be straight up you, like my body just stopped working. Like I couldn't even, like, this is pretty, a little bit personal, but my, my, uh, my reproductive organs, we'll put it that way, didn't work. Nothing works. You can and so say that, that. Yeah. So if I was to say like, what is rock bottom, that on a personal level for, for a male, like for me, that was rock bottom. Cause I was so confused. I knew all these. Uh, you know, live such a, in a way, a healthy lifestyle. Yeah. And my body just started to break down. So that was kind of like the humbling phase. So, you know, I, I kept doing stuff and, you know, that's where I actually created the kids book, the Powerman's kids book. Cause I was like, you know, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel like an absolute mess, um, internally, but, you know, I can still do good things. You know, it's, um, so that's where I started to put my focus into the kids book stuff. And it was like, well, you know what? I need to create something that can continue the message uh, where I don't have to be there. You know, the book, someone can read the book, not even know me. And that makes a difference. So I started to, to build different things outside of myself. Um, but that was, that was probably one thing that, was, you know, I've done just before COVID. I did 151 days on the road uh, touring yeah. for the kids' books at, at my cost. Um, and yeah. I'm lucky I had uh, Mercedes Benz help me out and gave me a car. But, you know, I had these massive costs and then COVID hit. So, you know, but these are they're just like the more the health stuff is really the worry because the financial stuff it can come and go. Yeah. Um, it was more the, it was more the, the inner, inner health stuff. Um, and that's how I got onto Dr. Dispenza's, um, meditations and was doing all that, you know, and then, uh, it actually just turned out in a big way. I was, um, I was, uh, low in zinc. Wow. I just had to supplement, put more zinc in my diet. Like I did a lot of inner work and kinesiology yeah. stuff and neuro training, which fixed up a lot of stuff. I had yeah. parasites. I had blood, par- had all these different things go on because uh, my immune system went down. Yeah. But um, yeah, bit of zinc and um, back to full health now. I'm absolutely rocking it. Wow, that's great. And there's yeah. so much that there's so much about so much that we don't even know about our bodies. You could have had this entire thing, but you could have just had more zinc. Um, but I guess, you know, yeah. we we're meant to find Dr. Joe meant to find um, those those neuro trainings, however, it got you out. But um, yeah. kind of 
like you didn't seem like anything was bothering you from the moment I met you. I think I was just like, wow, what an inspirational guy. Like he's super um, calm and cool and collected, but driven. You can feel your drive. I mean, you started the 30 day challenge um, first person in Australia too. Um, but obviously you're human still, you know, and yeah. uh, when you're called to be the guy on the stage, be the guy that, that is everybody's mentor. How do you deal with your own stuff when, you know, you've got to feel angry sometimes and upset and, and bitter or, or do you, how do you deal with those, those natural emotions? Um, well, so like uh, last couple of years, I've, cause of COVID as well as I took a step back from being in front of people doing the big yeah. seminars and all that. And I actually started doing personal training to fall back in love with working one-on-one uh, -on -one with someone. Right. So it was like, you know, there was a period of time where I was building bigger businesses, doing more leveraged things, but I was also trying to escape the grind of the one-on-one -on -one stuff. Yeah. You know, because, um, you know, I had this a bit of a, a lack mindset a little bit, you know, I'm coming, I'm, I'm poor, you know, I've, my, my value is in the money I earn. Like, you know, you know, a lot of people probably struggle with, you know, their parents say, get a job, you got to have a career, you got to have the money and all that. Yes. So I was kind of like, you know, I'd, I'd gone and, uh, you know, there's times where I was making more money than someone makes in a year and a night, you know, but that still wasn't, um, mm -hmm. that still wasn't, uh, my parents couldn't even comprehend that. So then they couldn't, they couldn't even go, well done. That's amazing. It was more like, you know, you still don't have a job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. You know, that, that was challenging stuff too, dealing with the more success you get monetarily and people think that, you know, uh, like, you know, you kind of get pulled down a little bit, the tall poppy syndrome or not being able to connect with people, you know, cause you do things differently. So, you know, there's lots of times where I felt more alone than ever before when I, things were going well for me because a lot of people weren't playing on the same level to a degree and couldn't even comprehend or respect what you were doing. Uh, but that was also when I was, when I was uh, a little bit too empathetic, empathetic to the world where I'd take on other people's energies too much because, you know, and, you know, when we talk about the kids' book stuff, it's what you think about you is the most important thing um, in a weird way. But so what do I do is I, um, you know, I have a really good uh, self-care sort of routine. So I know when I need to charge up when my cup's full, uh, full or empty, you could say. Um and a big one is I worked on a lot of uh, internal like trauma wounds sort of thing. Yeah. I've got like a little process that I sort of discovered in this whole journey of my health going down and how to sort of get to the bottom of those. Because when your health is, when your body's not working, That's sometimes true. those things can, can really uh, have a lot of power over you. So, um, you know, so you like double humbled. So yeah. I really worked on just cleaning all those things up and not like not solving or uh, not solving or fixing, but dissolving the whole problem to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of inner work there. That just made life so much lighter, freer, no baggage. Um, yeah, so things don't affect me as much. But yeah, just like everyone else, sleep, good food, have saunas, massages, yeah. um, boundaries, say no, don't overcome yourself in many ways. Like, yeah, so that's just great. that's how you sort of be human. But the the last thing I literally this week is I got to the bottom was the whole zinc thing with my testosterone and and body was um that was the missing piece because I felt that I wasn't um who who am I to stand on a crowd on a stage to tell people if I'm dealing with this issue uh, mm -hmm. within myself that I need to get to the bottom of um yeah. so that, that rocked my confidence a little bit uh, with the bigger crowd stuff but yeah now I um now I got to the bottom of it I feel like I can go back out and help more people. That's great. Do you, do you get nervous when you go on stage or when you're in front of uh, a lot of people? I mean, you've done it so much now, but. I think um, the nervous component comes sometimes like when I do talks and people say, oh, you're a motivational speaker. I'm like, well, I'm not, not a motivational speaker. I'm not here to, to motivate whatever. I'm here to help you find your drive, your why, you know, your purpose, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um. And so sometimes people want you to put on a performance, mm -hmm. you know, where, but you're like, you gotta, it's like, it's more the message you're getting across. So I'd probably say I get nervous sometimes if they try and really, if they like, you know, because you've done certain things in the past, they expect you to come and do that mm -hmm. in front of 400 people. Yeah. And, um, they're like, okay, well, like sometimes they think you're too much of a show versus like having meaning in what you do. Yeah. Um, 
but that's, that's sometimes when you get a little bit nervous or if you're doing something for the first time. Um, but yeah, just like anyway, everyone gets nervous. Um, yeah. I, I tend to swear a lot. I used to swear a lot in my talks and that really helped. And, um, <laughs> Yeah, I think I think the big one is is this is the saying before I talk is if there was a house on fire, would you be afraid to yell out to get the people out of the house? And you wouldn't. You'd go straight away. You'd be like, "Get out! Get out! Get out!" And so, like when I'm in a crowd and I'm talking about you know the health and them, yeah, you know, looking after themselves and all that, I see that as a very important thing because a lot of people are sitting there, their house is in their bodies on fire, but they're not doing anything. So you know, I've got to think about the benefit that that can have versus if I'm afraid of speaking or whatever. That's great. I'm going to picture that now. That's, that's, that's mm. so great. Um, and you do so many things like you're so multifaceted and multi-talented, but of all the things that you do, like with your, with your um, the book and writing and speaking, what lights you up the most? What are you most passionate about what you do? Uh, helping people, helping people get out of a, a stuck, um, how do you say stuck frame of mind like is in you know like I guess where I come from right I was, I was told to be seen not heard to um, you know people like us don't do things like this when it comes to traveling you know I remember I qualified for the American championships and I told my my mom all excitedly she's like no you've got to go to work you can't you can't go to America you know and I was like what do you mean I've just I'm qualified I've just won the strength championships like no no you can't and I was like, I've got the money. So, you know, when you're a kid, you're like, oh, we don't have the money. Yeah. I had the money in my bank. I was like, I've got the money. I've got the money. Oh, no, you got to save that. you got to save that. You know, so, yeah. and, and it's just because, you know, my mom's a beautiful person, but like, um, you know, like there was just so like breaking out of those chains of what we're supposed to do, we should do and all these kind of things. It's not even serving them. They just keep repeating it. Yeah. So, um. I'm really passionate about helping people really discover their potential and get rid of the limitations that are, uh, the, they're like mental chains from what their circumstances or surroundings and all that. And basically create like an inner environment greater than the external environment. Mm. So that's my real passion. And, and probably I'd say another one to that is helping people release the baggage they're holding on to. Um, so I've got like a little process I, a really simple process, not not technical at all, to help people actually get rid of their shit, shame, and pain. Cool. Um, and so I help them go through that, and that just makes someone have the capacity to deal with life's challenges. So instead of just struggling and being full or they can't handle everything, I'm burning out. Is I show this little process so they can work on themselves to then become freer, so then they can take on the opportunity. They can uh, see you know a problem. But more like a challenge, and hey, let's let's get to the bottom of it. Versus like, oh, why me? And become the victim. Yes, and I, I love that you have the the be the, the the victor mentality as opposed to be the victim. And um, you know, the lowest vibrations on the the scale are shame, um, shame, fear, and guilt. And yeah. those things, it's all the way that we speak to ourselves. That subconscious programming. My parents are very similar sounding to yours, and it's like you're absolutely right. They didn't have the Google that we have. They didn't have the books. They didn't yes. have the resources that we have. But it's so um, embedded. It's so written into their programming. And it's amazing that you can help people overcome that without actually... You're not making it complex. You're not making it too much. You're making it like eat, do, move. Like, you know, you make it accessible oh, to everyone. Oh, the seminar. Yeah. Eat, eat, eat think, do in the, in the seminar. Yeah. Eat, think, do. do. Yeah. All that. And yeah, you do so uh, many of those. Totally. They, what I was going to ask mm. you is, um, like, obviously, you, you work with so many different kinds of people. How do you mm. deal with uh, the ones that they just really want to hang on to blame, justification, excuses? How do you help them get past those? Or do you just kind of say, maybe you're not ready for my stuff yet? Yeah, you, you just got to like, um, you know, sometimes people are going to burn to learn, you know, mm. so they're, they're still sitting on the hot plate, like, great. Um, you know, like it's, you can never, I never help, I never fix someone or s if I solve their problems, they're reliant on me to pain the ass. You know, you know, they'll, they'll be motivated when I'm in their presence. I teach people self-reliance. So if they're not ready, um, you know, good luck with that. That's yeah. your, that's your life. You know, before I used to take on a lot of baggage and try and help them and do yeah. everything and text them and call them when they're not turning up. But it's like, Hey, like when you're ready, you'll be ready. When you're sick of this, 
uh, way, call me, you know, um, you know, when you're ready to make change. So, you know, you can, you can, you can, you can inspire people and all that, but we all have our own journey. We all, sometimes we need to headbutt the wall a million times before we, we find some answers and that's the pain that's going to teach you. So, um, so what I do with that is, is sometimes, you know, for example, my parents, if I worked on my own shit, so therefore I see them differently and with more love and compassion than ever before, which makes them feel that when they're around me and the experience is a lot nicer. They're, 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 they feel less judged. They feel less guilt and shame. And the more better success we do as kids, like us, I got two sisters, the better we do. And the energy they feel when they're around us, it gives them room to grow as well, you know, because parents are just trying to do the best they can. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, you know, when I did a lot of the inner work stuff, when I'm around my dad, if I'm calm, my dad's calm. You know, like it's now I can start to lead, lead the vibration, you could say, yeah. when we're together. Um, so then all of a sudden he then has a good weekend around us, you know, and then all of a sudden he's, he's brought up. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's yeah, the best can't. answer. Love is always yeah, the best that's, answer, that's, yeah. right? Like raise the vibe. Yeah. And uh, it takes a lot of work, I think, to not let something trigger you and to just um, transcend that and, and be the be the vibe you want to feel. So that's amazing. Um, yeah. You made me think of a quote uh, talking about clients like Tony Robbins is um, when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. That's when change will happen. And it made me think like you and I talked a lot about different books we were into, um, but kind of a nerdy question here. I mean, obviously you're an author now, but what kind of, what's your favorite book or quote or something that's changed you that you keep coming back to? Is there any kind of specific one that you can hone in on or recommend? Yeah, there's a few. There's um, the myth of stress. Which is an a very old book, kind of has like a bit of a religious, a Christian kind of tone to it. The guy was it was like in the forties or fifties it was written. So the myth of stress, amazing book, very much you know it's yeah it's, it's a very awesome book. You know because everyone says I'm stressed, I'm stressed, yeah. And yeah so it's a very author? awesome book. Uh, I can't remember. The I'll author, look it up. It's an look old, it up. old book, white 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 writing with red outline, and it's blue book. Um, the myth of stress, my best mate's dad, who's a psychologist, um, he, he is a sky, psychologist, business guy. So he mm. was an amazing guy, like went out to a small country town with a, like $500 and yeah, like just to transform this town and become a school teacher and did a lot of good stuff. He, when he passed away, I got uh, this book given to me from him. So that was a really, really powerful book. It's still relevant to today. So the myth of stress. The other one is um, the alchemist. Uh, oh, the alchemist was kind of one early on when I was in Germany. I read that. And the other one was um, uh, awareness by Anthony Demello. Oh, yeah. So awareness by oh, that's epic. Like Anthony Demello's work is incredible, and you know that's came, kind of gave a bit of the inspiration with the, with the work I do around the shit, shame or pain list. Which oh. is also around judgment, guilt, and shame. Um, that's a really good book. And then I really loved uh, Dr. Joe Spencer, the way he talks. Yeah. Um, best speaker I've ever heard, you know, live. Uh, early on, did some Tony Robbins stuff. I got given tapes when I was an electrician. I used to listen yeah. to the tapes in between work sites. <laughs> and that's how I learned to speak by shadowing. So as he would talk, I would talk to his tune and his voice. Cool. And that's how I learned. Yeah, so there's just a few for you to oh, check out. Peter awesome. Green's got some really good stuff as well. Yeah, I will definitely look up the um, Anthony DeMello for sure. I'll look up all of those. Yeah, that sounds great. You'll love Anthony DeMello, yeah. Cool. And I was just going to ask you too, kind of um, one, like it's kind of a morbid question. Um, how do you want people to talk about you at your funeral? But it's how do you want to be remembered? Like you make such an impact on people's lives. Their health and health is the most important thing. Um, but you. How would you like people? How would you like to be remembered? Um, I'd you'd, I'd probably love like I guess the best thing is like if I, just say everyone's there at your funeral is that they they're all sitting there with experiences and um, you know achievements and all these different things from knowing like in, by because I was a part of their life they're sitting there richer within themselves because of the life I lived and meeting and stuff. So it's kind of like, yeah, I may be gone physically, but 
all the, the the chats we've had, all the little breakthroughs and all the little techniques they've learned and the experiences we've had that they're sitting there going, hey, what a life, you know, like that was awesome. Like I'm then going to do uh, and pass that on and be, you know, do, be their best and all that. So kind of like everyone in the room is sitting there richer and has, uh, I guess, you know, what a life feeling versus like just sad because like, yeah. Um, what, what, what did you have an expectation we're all going to live forever? Like, come on, we're all going to die someday. <laughs> so, um, yeah, sitting there just going, yeah, what a life. Well, well, well done. You know, like, I don't know. That's probably how to, a, yeah. That's great. Uh, everyone's sitting there feeling a little bit richer within themselves than, uh, by knowing me. Awesome. I know I am. And, um, I, I shared this <laughs> briefly with you, but just, um, here on the call, like, uh, your work inspires me to to do this. Like one of the reasons that I'm I'm doing this is I'm sitting with you. I think we had we're having coffee, and I've never seen someone have like three breakfasts, but like and like two juices, and a coffee, and something. It was impressive to watch you eat, actually. But um, that was for the whole foods time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. a whole lot of foods, but it was delicious. Mm. And and you know, you were sharing with me. You got to get your voice out there, and if you want this, you do this. And, and I've taken those steps and not all of them, but um, a lot of them. And they've got me to talk with you again in, in three years later. So I'm so, so, so grateful to you. Um, I just want to share with as many more people possible. Like how can people find you? You've got the website, LinkedIn, or sorry, um, Instagram and Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. We've got uh, Instagram, Facebook. I'm going to do a lot more on those channels uh, soon. Cool. So um, I took a bit of a hiatus to a degree, I just use them for the purpose of what I need them for. Yeah. But um, I'll do a little bit more on them. So, yeah, it's Instagram, Dave Power to Bain. Um, you know, Facebook, David Power to Bain, P O W T A B A I N. Through you, they can they can text you and go, Hey, I want to get in contact with this guy. Right. Um, you know, if there's any like any school teachers out there, I do school programs so they can get in contact. You know, I normally get local businesses to buy the books for the school so the kids get them. Um, yeah, they can just jump on your on your page and send you a message maybe and then they can find me. That's great. Uh, Dave, I'm so happy to connect with you. I'm so grateful for your time. Thanks for tuning in to Power Perspectives. My guest today was Dave Pow to Bain and you can find him on social media at David Pow to Bain on Facebook or on the same name at Instagram. Until next time, remember our ability to shift perspective is our greatest power. I'm Shannon. Thanks for being with me.